It starts in the afternoon, moves through the long summer twilight into a night filled with whirling lights. It reaches halfway at dawn. Finally, after a long morning, the afternoon comes round once more, and the full day's cycle is complete. It is the great race whose name joins time with place, the 24 hours of Le Mans. To race here is to be drawn into a maelstrom of speed, spiraling around the track as if geared invisibly to the finish line clock. It is a world of calculation and of nerve, of careful engineering and moments when everything goes wrong. Through the decades, each Le Mans has been won in a different way. Canetti drove all but 20 minutes. Hill and John Abier waited patiently for others to break. Voigt and Gurney took their big Ford and crushed the opposition, while Porsches dominated the 80s through sheer weight of numbers. Some years the race is won on the drawing board, others by team tactics, sometimes by a stroke of last minute luck. And once it came to this, sheer desperation. What shape will the race take this year? One team's journey to victory is about to begin. A journey from day to night and back. From being one of many to being the one, the winner of the 24 hours of Le Mans. the next 24 hours, the 48 entrants of Le Mans 2000 will live by the clock. Right now it shows about 28 minutes to go before the start. Time enough for the crowd of 200,000 still arriving from all over Europe to take their places along this eight mile track. Time enough for this very hot afternoon in northern France to grow even hotter. Time for racing's greatest warrior to wonder if in this next day he will fulfill the ambition of a lifetime. Hello everybody, I'm Sam Posey. Welcome to Speed Vision's live coverage of this great classic, the 68th running of Le Mans. We will be bringing you the entire race, flag to flag, except for 90 minutes when we will cut away for qualifying for the Canadian Grand Prix. That'll be in about three and a half hours. Now, so far in the pre-race action here at Le Mans, could be summed up by one word, Audi. Alan Decadene has the story. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Sam. The buzzword here all week has been Audi. Which team has the best prepared and presented cars to win this race? Audi. Who eclipsed all the opposition in the practice sessions? Audi. And I'll tell you something else as well. In the 30 years I've been coming, I've never seen a car team so well prepared to win this race. They've also got the Yost factor, which nobody else has. Raynald Yost's cars have won this race four times. And I think, Raynald, you must be partly confident in having this one away. Yes, we had uh, a good test results. The car is fast enough, so I'm quite happy. But uh, I must say I'm nervous. <laughs> well, 24 hours is still a long time. That is right. It's a long, long race and uh, nearly 5,000 kilometers long. So wait and see. So there you have it, Sam, from the man himself. Well, Alan, Audi is so comprehensively prepared, they even have their own newspaper extolling the virtues of their racing team. Now, working with me is David Hobbs, and David, Audi has really assembled a juggernaut. They have indeed, and of course, so many shoe-ins have gone wrong. Back in 1956, a privately owned, owned D-Type beat the factory D-Types and the factory Ferraris. In 1969, Porsche came here with an absolutely dominating field of 908s. They were 15 seconds quicker than the GT40s. What won? A four-year-old GT40. The last two years, 97 and 98 and 99, Toyota spent over $100 million to win this race and came up short all three times. In 1987, I drove car number seven, owned and run by Reinhold Yost. Absolute shoe-in, I was told. You guys are gonna just clean right up. We sure cleaned up. We cleaned up our dinner plate at about half past five that afternoon. So nothing in this race is ever sure. Number seven, of course, is the great number, lucky number for Reinhold Yost. Four of his victories have come with that number. 
But as David said, anything can go wrong. And if it does, and the Audis break down, the race breaks open suddenly into a dogfight among at least six different teams. With that story, here's Derek Daly. Sam, if there's any type of hiccup on the Audi regime, you could add the Panos name to the history books here as possible winners. Now, Panos are trailblazers. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia. They're going to try and attempt to win a race of this caliber with a front-engined car. That has not been done since 1962. This is the lead car. Star-studded driver lineup. Leading off is David Brabham, son of three times Formula One world champion, Sir Jack Brabham. He has ex-Formula One driver Jan Magnussen with him, but maybe the most famous name at Le Mans this year is the great Mario Andretti. Mario has been featured in every magazine, every newspaper since he arrived here about a week ago. But Mario, at 60 years young, people want to know why? Why still do this? Well, I keep asking myself <laughs> as well, but uh, you know, it's uh, we love these classic events. Uh, I mean, uh, Le Mans is Le Mans, and. Um, it's got that draw, and uh, it's really worth doing, you know. For, uh, for me, uh, I know that I have, uh, probably don't have a lot to gain, a lot more to lose to some degree, but, uh, you know, I've been rolling the dice all my life, and, uh, and sometimes they come up pretty good, so I'm looking for that one. Now, the car has not been great throughout practice and qualifying, but you think it's good now for the race? I think the setup is uh, quite nice. Uh, uh, thanks to David, uh, he was uh, quite happy on our last uh, practice, and I got in it this morning for uh, you know a lap and a half or so, and um, and it certainly confirms that. So we're we're quite happy with that. David, the heat alone here is going to be a problem. Well, it's obviously quite hot. Um, you know, the engines are going to be hotter than normal, uh, so we just really have to play it by ear. I mean, we feel we're prepared for it. Uh, I don't know if that affects the turbos more, being you know a little bit hotter. So. We just have to wait and see. This is the team many people focus on, particularly on Mario Andretti. He's been here seven times, started in 1966, finished second back in 95. Wow, can you imagine if Mario Andretti wins the Le Mans 24 hour race and adds that jewel to his enormous crown? Like the drivers who seek to win it, Le Mans is a race of many moods, a world compressed into 24 hours, a long day that glitters with all the facets of a diamond sometimes beautiful, sometimes horrifying. Le Mans can be tense, and it can be funny. It can be grand, and it can be glorious. Stay with us, Le Mans 2000 is about to begin. I've seen it in that for a very long, reconnaissance lap. Now, you might wonder why the start is so important. And the reason is publicity. Here in Europe, where the race is so popular, it's the biggest race in Europe, there are two photographs that are published and republished all the time. The winner, the leader at the end of the first lap, which is, runs in all the Sunday papers, and the leader at the end of the race, which makes all the Monday papers. Now, obviously, in the next few minutes, we're going to know who is in front on that first shot, and the Audi team would deeply love it to be them, and of course the others would like to stop them. Now Cadillac is in the race this year, and surprisingly it's not for the first time. 50 years ago, millionaire sportsman Briggs Cunningham brought two Cadillacs here, including this streamlined one cooked up by an aerodynamicist who apparently was not concerned very much by aesthetic considerations. Today they bring two different teams, a works team and a European-based team called DAMS, and they look very competitive indeed. We, we now have Calvin Fish with Andy Wallace, a man who won this race three years ago. Calvin? Well, Cadillac are really making a major assault on Le Mans. They have four cars here for this year, and they also have a multi-year program in promise. And uh, the, really the heart of this is the solid driver lineup that they've formed, and the, really the heart of that lineup is Andy Wallace. He's won so many of these events, three times at Daytona, two times at Sebring. He's won the Petit. You've won here, Andy. What is the key to success in these big ones? Well, you know, Calvin, this is really a, a very much a team effort uh, for the long races. Every single member of the crew has to pull his weight to, to get this right. But it's also preparation for a whole year. Everybody's working right from straight after this race, ready for next year's race. And uh, you, what you mustn't do is, is make too many mistakes, and that's where the good crew comes in. 
You were here a year ago, Andy, with the Audi effort. You're in year one with Cadillac. How is their progress in comparison? Well, um, as you say, I started the first year with the Audi program. I think now the Cadillac is actually further on than we were with Audi, even in the first year. So I'm really looking forward to this race and for the future years. Well, Andy is going to be hard-pressed to actually increase his tally of victories, but a podium finish is certainly on the cards for Cadillac here at Le Mans. Thanks a lot, Calvin. Now, David, they ran into some trouble this morning. They did. One of their cars crashed on the uh, morning warm-up. They've got the car back on the grid. That's the car of Christian Colby. And, of course, he's right. They, they have got a long learning curve here. They've got a three-year commitment. They've got some very good drivers. And, of course, there's no earthly reason why a company as big and as, as well-blessed with money as Cadillac shouldn't be able to win this race eventually. Exactly. Well, the cars are assembled on the grid. It is over 90 degrees here right now, which is going to be part of the story. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Speed Vision's live coverage of the 68th running of Le Mans. Less than 15 minutes to go now before the start, and with me is Greg Kramer. And Greg, you'll be anchoring a good deal of the coverage, and of course you and I spent time watching practice and qualifying, and it wasn't what we saw that kind of surprised us, it was what we heard. Well, it was a distinctly American sound, and it was music to our ears, frankly. Five different chassis are being powered here by American muscle this year. Three in the LMP, the prototype category, the Cadillacs, the Reynards with the Mopar sprint car engines, and the, the uh, Ford Roadsters from Panos. But it's in the GTS division, the La GTS division, frankly, that history is being made. For the first time, two full-out factory, American factory efforts are going head-to-head -head for the class win. But it is very much, in a way, a battle that's rejoined. Earlier this year at Daytona, the Corvettes were incredibly fast, put their cars on the pole. However, as the race unfolded, the Vipers went back to the front and, in fact, won overall when the prototypes had problems. The Corvettes finished a very close second. Interestingly now, the, uh, the development here is a possibility of a huge race. And with more on that, the newest member of our broadcast team is Steve Evans. Thank you, Greg, and ho hello, everyone. To no one's surprise, the Chrysler Viper, as it's badged in Europe, is on the pole, looking for their third straight Le Mans victory. They've been crushing the competition for four years all over the world, including the American Le Mans series. Now, with me is Lou Petain, who's vice president and director of racing worldwide for Daimler Chrysler. Now, Lou, this might sound funny to some people, but having the Corvette here, healthy and ready to play, is good. Absolutely. They've raised our game, to be honest with you, since they've gotten more competitive with us. I mean, we're within tenths of a second now. Um, they really pushed us to a higher level. It really motivated us to win Daytona and Sebring this year. And I got to tell you, this is going to be a real dogfight today. I can see this being a 24-hour sprint race, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> I think he could be right. And a big enemy of these drivers may be the heat, as you mentioned. It's 152 degrees in the cockpit of the Viper yesterday, and it's warmer again today. Gersey Schrader. Thanks, Steve. I'm sitting here right now with the Corvette, and for this car to win today, it will have to overcome two things. First of all, that heat you talked about, and secondly, the Viper. Now, all eyes will be upon this man, my friend and former driving teammate, Ron Fellows. Ron, talk about the start of this race and this heat. Well, it's, uh, like I said, Dorsey, it's incredibly hot. Uh, we just got to be smart. You know, it's a long race, and uh, try to be careful. Conservative, uh, it's, like I said, it's 24 hours, and, um, man, it's hot. I got to say, happy birthday, Patrick. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Sam. Well, guys, I can tell you this. With cockpit temperatures over 160 in this Corvette and no driver suits because they cannot do driver changes with them, I'll tell you what, this is going to be a 24-hour test of man and machine. And it's a test we're most certainly going to be eyeing very closely. We're very happy to welcome another new member to our Le Mans broadcast team. It's the 1985 Indy 500 winner, 88 card titleist, and, of course, three-time factory Le Mans driver, Danny Sullivan. And Danny, we've talked about three of the four classes here, but there's one in the slower, lighter weight Le Mans uh, prototype, the 675 class, a team that's caught your eye. Well, the LMP class is interesting because it's a lighter car, smaller engine, and so forth, but they can go a great distance on fuel. They can go 17, 18 laps on fuel. The Audis are going to stop around 11. They've got a good horsepower. They're only about nine seconds off of the Audis' fastest time. They have a good driver lineup. Look out. And as David Hobb mentioned, I've driven for Ryan Old Ghost before in one of those invincible teams at Daytona, and we were out within the first four hours. It can happen to the best. That's no discredit to to Yost or to Audi. 
Well, that is, of course, the nature of endurance racing. And as a matter of fact, as we take a look at the hands of the most famous timepiece in all of auto racing, we're within 10 minutes of the start of the 68th running of the San Cator Dumas. We'll be right back. The tension, the excitement, the heat continues to build here under a blazing blue sky at Le Mans. It is with great delight that we always welcome Andrew Marriott back to our broadcast team. And Andrew, in the Le Mans GT division, we might actually see the most intense racing as there's a veritable phalanx of Porsches here in that class. And it's Porsches most assuredly here at Le Mans doing what they are renowned for, servicing the customer. Absolutely right. Well, there were only two cars in that class last year, but now there's a dozen of them. Now, they aren't all the same. They started the same. On the pole, Christophe Bouchou. But he is not the man to beat. He is the Labra competition, a French prepared car. It is an American car, which is the one to beat. And that is the Dick Barber machine. And of course, that's got brilliant Bob Wallach in it with two young German drivers. I also think that to watch for the Sky car. I also think that the Sky car will uh, do well. That's the one with Murray in, and also with uh, Johnny Mullen and Sasha Masson. And uh, Court Wagner, he's another man that you have to watch out for, Greg. Well, and Andrew, for many drivers, their best opportunity, and perhaps their first opportunity to run at Le Mans is in the Le Mans GT category. Certainly is true with Americans this year. With more on that, let's go back down to Calvin Fish. Cal? Well, Greg, there are 38 rookies in the field this year, but when you look at their driving resume, they don't appear rookies. In fact, one of the drivers won two GT championships in the States last year. He was awarded the very prestigious Porsche Cup Award, and that man is, of course, American Court Wagner. Court, you're here for the very first time at Le Mans. Is it every bit as magical as you expected it to be? It really is, Galvin. It's a dream come true for an all-American effort here. The Aspen Knowles entry is doing an amazing job. We qualified fourth, and we're just looking forward to a great 24 hours. The passion, the people, I mean, you see this place, the parade yesterday, the French, I mean, you can't see any more passion in one place for sports car racing. This is really what it's everybody dreams of and coming here and doing. It's, it's an amazing. Well, for many drivers, the dream is just being here. For many others who repeat and come back, the dream is the success and victory. And for more on that story, let's go to a new man on our broadcast team, and that's Guy Hobbs. Thanks, Carl. I'm down here with Bob Wallet, the 56-year-old Frenchman. Your 30th career attempt here at Le Mans. What is the lure, Bob, that brings you here? Well, I love it. I love racing. I love Le Mans. I love this atmosphere. 200,000 people, sunshine, great racing. So, why shouldn't I come? I'm still competitive. I'm a factory Porsche driver. I drive a good car and a very good team. Dick Barber Racing, Porsche GT3, the best in this class. So I have, I have fun. Well, good luck to you in your 30th attempt. We hope to see the finish line tomorrow. He made his debut in 1968. Can he win the 68th running of the Le Mans 24 hours? Well, he's already biked here from Strasbourg. This is a gentleman who remains in great shape. Some of us will be back with you a little bit later in the show. When we come back, Sam, David, and Derek are going to take a look at this great track and the starting lineup. Welcome back. I'm Sam Posey along with Derek Daly and David Hobbs. And gentlemen, they are about halfway down the Bullzon Strait halfway around the reconnaissance lap. David Hobbs, this is a track that is extremely familiar to you, but would you take us around it, please? Well, in my mind, this is one of the great tracks of the world, eight and a half miles long, average speed around about 140 miles an hour. Uh, the Mulsanne straight, you've got two chicanes right now, which you never had before 1990, which slows you down for the Mulsanne kink. Into the Mulsanne corner there, tight right-hand hairpin, very fast, slightly downhill run to the Indianapolis, the only real left-hander on this track. Up to a quick shot to Arnage, a real quite uh, sharp right-hander, and then it leads you right through to the Porsche curves. These are newish curves, they've only been there about 20 years, very, very fast, high-speed run down to the two Ford chicanes, then up past the pits around the Dunlop curve, a very famous corner, then through the S's and Tet Rouge, back onto the straight, and that is a Cadillac track map. So as they make their way around this final warm-up, let's take a quick look at our starting grid. On the pole, car driven by Alan McNish, Laurent Aiello, and Stefan Ortelli, one of the Audi R8s. They've been spectacular here every time they've been on the track. Second on the grid is another Audi, Vila Christensen and Emmanuel Piro. Second row, another Audi, Alboreto, Christian Apt, and uh, Capello, and outside row two, David Brabham, Jan Magnussen, and Mario Andretti in the Panos. 
On row three, car number 21, which is a Lola B2K10, driven by Schiattarella, lead driver, Deradigas and Naspetti. Alongside him is Philippe Gachet. He's also starting for Marto and Cotas. They're in a Courage C60. Alongside them, Stefan Johans, a million names for Americans, John Matthews and Guy Smith and Reynard. And then the second of the paying-offs with Hiroki Kato starting that car. Johnny O'Connell from America also driving. And then move on back the first of the Cadillacs. Eric Bernard, Emmanuel Collard, who will start the car, and Frank Montagne, the Frenchman. Beside him, Jan Lammers, remember him from Formula One and sports cars? He is uh, joined by Peter Cox and Tom Cornell, that is an all-Holland entry. Next back, Frank Lagorce, uh, Butch Leitzinger, and Andy Wallace, another of the Cadillac LMPs, and then Suzuki Kagayama and his brother, Kagiyama in this, another of the Panos LMP1 cars. In 13th spot, another Panos LMP1 with Tsukiyaki, who's starting, Hiroki Kondo and Aida, another Japanese team. Yannick Dalmas, the four-time winner here, is starting in the Reynard 2K10 with Manassian and Jean-Pierre Bellot. Then, John Nielsen, a very famous guy, nearly won here in the Jag. He's driving with uh, Graf and Mauro Boldi and another Panos, and then comes the second of the Cadillacs, with Max Angelelli, this is being driven on the start by Wayne Taylor. As you move on back, the next two rows is a Courage, two Reynards, and then the last of the Cadillac LMP cars, Mark Goosens, Christoph Tinso, and Christian Colby, who crashed this morning in the warm-up. Then we go down to Thomas Fisher, who's got a, a two-year-old BMW, Didier Chase, another familiar guy from America, uh, in a Reynard. And then, of course, we get the first Oliver Bretta in the Chrysler Vipers. And as you look on down through the rest of our starting grid, we have four different classes here. We've introduced them all except the last of the class, which is the GT. Fastest in that was Christoph Bouchou, ex-Formula One test driver, Shiro and Grigard. I think I pronounced that right. The fastest car here most of the weekend was uh, Mueller, Lohr, uh, Lucas Luer, and Bob Wallach. That is Dick Barber's car. This is the hottest day we have had in France this week, 110 degrees on the track. Mario Andretti told me off camera, it is the hottest he has ever experienced here. We will see fatigue being a factor. Well, I've been here, I've been here 26 times and I've never had such a hot day as it is today and it's gonna get hotter and tomorrow. We're supposed to be even hotter still. So uh, it's gonna be brutal on these cars and of course these drivers. As Huge presence here by GM. In fact, they're pace cars. That is a Cadillac that will pace this race here, bringing them slowly down through the last of the four chicanes. There is one of the Cadillacs. The start takes place in front of the pits. Cadillac pulls off of three Audi R8Rs. Look at the crowd here, more than 200,000 people come year after year to the greatest endurance motor race in the world, and we're underway. And Audi has accomplished their first goal leading one, two, three into the first turn, the picture that will be now be flashed all over Europe. Well, as you say, tomorrow morning's papers, there they go, under that incredibly famous picture of the Dunlop Bridge, down to the S's for the first time, a beautiful left, right sweep, very fast, used to be, of course, that the guardrail was right to the edge of the road, now there's a lot of runoff area, into Ted Rouge, a fast right hander, a little bit bumpy, you see those poplar trees on the left when we used to drive here, they just used to leave straw bales on those, and now they leg it off, down the famous Mulsan Strait. Used to be four miles dead straight. They've got a couple of chicanes in the middle of it now to slow these cars down just a little bit. Still in all, an average speed of over 140 miles an hour. And still, despite the chicanes along the long Mulsan Strait here, they still get speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour. In the old days, they were doing 250 miles an hour. What a shot here. That's the first chicane, which is a right, left, right. David Brabham is in that red Panos. He started that car. He will do a double stint. The starters in the Audis, Magnish, Frank Biela, and Alvaretto. Schiattarella is in the Lola, the Olive Garden Lola. You see the green car at the top of your shot there. Going to fend off somebody. Here they come into the second chicane. Again, up to about 200 miles an hour just before they break for this chicane, which, as you can see, is a left, right, left. Nobody likes the chicanes. Not a single driver here likes the chicanes. They love the old days when this kink here, this kink they're running through right now, was flat only for the Brave at about 248 miles an hour. 
Here's yeah. a controversial part of the track. They're talking about taking this hump out of the track for further safety. Cars have flown off there into the woods. This is the hairpin at the end of the Molson Strait. It's right in front of the town of Molson. And now you turn east, I'm uh, sorry, west toward the town of Arnage. The track really goes point to point to three towns. That little right hand sweep there, boy oh boy, that was a real hold your breath job too. And as they sweep down this next little right hand sweep, there's a bit of a crest there, so it's not very easy at night. You tend to get a lot of shadows in there from the headlights. And then they plunge into this fantastically fast right hand bend. Immediately exiting that, they tight on the brakes for Indianapolis, the only left handed corner here. And up to Arnage, the village of Arnage is right about where the camera is here. And, and of course, this right-hand hair, right-handed hairpin. And David Brabham and the Painos hanging on to the back of Michele Alboreto. These Audis were on average three seconds a lap faster than the whole field in every practice session. This morning in the warm-up, again, they were about three seconds a lap faster. So David Brabham hanging on nicely here to Michele Alboreto running third on the road here. Audis one, two, and three. Derek, you spoke of the heat. Audi has done special testing to uh, test their cars in the heat at Kailami in South Africa. So they are, should be anyway, in pretty good shape. It's hard to say about the other teams. Ask what the budget is for Audi to try and win the Le Mans 24 hour race. Figures in excess of $100 million are bandied around. That is an idea of the prestige of winning the Le Mans 24 hour race and if they are successful and it is a long 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 way to go you will see it advertised on a global level because Audi are using the platform of motor racing to make a statement about their vehicles their technology their engineers and their general corporate abilities speak about their engineers on this team alone they have five doctors of engineering PhDs of engineering working on these cars and 12 men to do nothing but man computers almost on a 24-hour basis. 17 engineers on this team and David Brabham still hangs on nicely. This is the car from the team of Trailblazers. Atlanta, Georgia, they're trying to win a race in a front-engined car. That is difficult. They're actually building a new car in Atlanta at the moment with a racing engine, four-liter, high-revving racing engine, smaller, lighter package that will reduce the frontal area. And that may take this another step further in its battle to be competitive and dominate uh, the American Le Mans series and, of course, the European race. One of the things about sitting so far back in the car, as you see David Brabham do as he takes the first of the chicanes here, is that it, it makes the car feel very twitchy. Any slide, David, to the right or the left, you really feel it when you're sitting almost over the rear axle. Absolutely, you feel it tremendously easy to overtake. Now, look at this Philippe Gash in the Courage has come up to fifth. Right behind him is the Reynard. The number 24 car. Stefan Johansson Stephen started Johansson. that car. Stefan, of course, uh, almost retired, came back to sports car racing very successfully. He drove for Reinhold Yost here several years ago. I think it was 97 when he won the Le Mans 24 hour race. But this is a private team run by Jim Matthews and Stefan. And uh, this Reynard has been an enormous improvement over the car that was a disappointment at the Sebring 12 hour race earlier in March this year. And Hiroki Kato is holding on to them there in the number 12 uh, Painos car. This is the point in the race where you try to keep your adrenaline down, where you try to avoid dicing with people. You're so excited. The start's just moments ago. You really want to grab the headlines. You want to look good. You're feeling racy. But you have to remind yourself this huge, huge race stretches ahead. And the objective is to come in and not have hurt the car in any way. So the Audis continue to run one, two, three. David Brabham, though, is right there taking the fight to him. That will be the interest, particularly as Mario Andretti gets in that car of about hour five. Welcome back to the early moments of Le Mans with the Audis run one, two, three. Don't forget, the only time we'll be breaking away from Le Mans will be for Formula One qualifying from Canada from 1 p.m. Eastern time until 2.30 Eastern. You'll see qualifying in its entirety. Then it's back here for another 20 hours or so of live coverage from Le Mans. Simply the best racing coverage on the planet, and it's only 
on speed vision. Earlier on, this was our first retirement. This is Yannick Dalmas, believe it or not. This is a prototype Chrysler. The engine in this started life as a World of Outlaws aluminium block reduced in size uh, by John Caldwell in San Diego. But that is very much a development program for next year's real challenge from Chrysler in the prototype class. They were very lucky to get Yannick Dalmas to drive that car. He's a multiple Le Mans winner. They're very lucky to get John Caldwell to build the engine be interesting to see what's gone wrong. That car has, as a team, tremendous potential. Well, Yannick Dalmas has certainly known the heights and the lows of uh, Le Mans now, out in uh, two and a half laps, and of course a four-time winner here before. So Yannick Dalmas' day not running well at all. Our world feed pictures here are provided to us by French television, so we do not have direct control of what you will see. But they usually cover Le Mans very well. Good battle here for six, seven. Among the prototypes. That's a 16 car, that's a, a Pescarolo Sport Courage. A, a, Henri's famous colors, his helmet was always that color. That bright he's, green. He's here this weekend, but of course he's not driving for the first time. Right behind those are the two LMP 675 cars, the Volkswagen and the two liter engines in those lighter cars. These guys can do a lot more laps than the bigger cars. They have less fuel on board, but they still do a lot more mileage. And uh, a lot of people think that towards the end of the race, those guys are gonna be right in the thing. And they've just gone tremendously well so far. Now, we just saw the prototype Chrysler pull over. The man who, of course, leads that team, Hugh DeShonek, also leads the Viper team. He's down in the pit lane with our Calvin Fish. Cal? Well, Hugh, obviously a problem with the number five car early. Any indication from uh, Yannick what the problem was with the car? Yes, it's an uh, engine problem that we have uh, seen on the telemetry. And uh, we are, it's an whole pressure problem, so we are just looking if uh, Yannick can uh, bring back slowly the car there, just uh, like that we can see if we can do something. But uh, as you know, an engine problem at the beginning of the race is always, uh, always a big problem because it's difficult to repair, but uh, we have to see when the car is coming back. Have you suffered a similar problem during your testing with the engine, or is this something new? No, completely something new. We were absolutely not waiting for a such problem. It's the first time that we have uh, this problem. You have a big team here this weekend, Hugh. You're going for your third victory in a row in the GTS category. How are the Vipers running out there? Do you expect a tough battle with the Vets today? Yeah, I think the battle will be very high because the Corvette are uh, putting a big pressure on us. Uh, but uh, our strategy is just uh, to follow exactly what we want to do during the race and not to try to uh, play with the Corvette. We will just uh, follow our lap time that we have decided and at midnight we will decide exactly our strategy for the second part of the race. Okay, well, good luck for the next 23 hours. Thank you very much. We need it. The American public obviously got to know Hugh DeShonek for the first time really at Daytona this year when the Vipers won uh, overall, so he led a great French chant on the... Uh, whoa, whoa, the courage is spun. Whoa. Yikes. Yikes, a 12 car of Cato just sleeped through there, squeaked through as the Courage spun. Boy, has he stalled it? That was the fifth place car running just a little bit over its head. I was obviously. just about to say what a terrific battle that was for fifth place, and then he went and spun it like that. That's Philippe Gash uh, driving that... Courage. Philippe Gash, of course, a veteran of Indianapolis. He almost got himself collected here. Boy, he did. This is a replay. Stefan Johansson leads through. Oh, Stefan misses it too. He saw it un unfold in front of him early enough. And the painos with Cato just managed to save himself. That was an incredibly close battle there, and just right behind them also, an unbelievable battle from 8th through to 11th, absolutely on each other's toes. This is a car with a very, very high top speed, about 6 to 8 miles an hour, faster even than the Audis, a function of a setup which features very, very low drag body work with good, solid power. And of course, the team run by Henri Pescarolo. 
fight. This one is not. This is Philip Gash put this team together. But here's a slow roll. He puts his hand in the air when he knows all is lost, hoping that Cater can see him early enough and miss him. Welcome back to the sunshine of the Le Mans 24 Air Race. A warmer day than we have seen here all week. 110 degrees track temperature. Gives us a chance to have a look at our Porsche storylines. Number one is the awesome Audis. Just about everybody said they are a shoe-in to dominate here. They have dominated every session so far. However, we know from history, it doesn't always follow through. Does Mario's dream become a reality? The only major international motor race that Mario Andretti has yet to win. Wow, what a story it will be. Cadillac returns. Well, here's a, a, an automaker that specializes in quality cars, expensive luxury cars. They have come back to go racing again at Le Mans for the first time in 50 years since Briggs Cunningham brought a pair of Cadillacs here. American muscle. It is amazing how many cars are powered this year by American engines, including the Vipers that you're looking at and the Corvette. At least five times, at least five of the teams have American engines in them, and the American engines are currently running fourth, and sixth, and seventh. So they are being a presence already very early in this race. These big engines have learned how to run reliably for 24 hours, which of course is the key. You're watching the lead Viper. This is car number 51, Carl Wendlinger, who incidentally was to start in the prototype car. They brought him back into the Viper because the challenge from the Corvette was so fierce that they put him back in here. And in fact, we're going to see a Corvette take or at least have a look at taking a position from the second of the Vipers in line. The second of the Vipers is, the, is car number 52. Calvin? Well, a story on the GTS category is the heat. There's really hot temperatures here, ambient around 90 today and tomorrow, and that's really a problem for the front engine cars. It really puts a lot of cockpit temperature inside the cars for the drivers, so the guys are really concerned on both the VET team and the Viper team whether they're going to get dehydrated. They feel that people like Vendlinger, certainly Beretta, and uh, Fellows will be able to deal with it, but some of the rookies on those teams, they may struggle a little bit as they fight the car a little bit more over 24 hours. And that is Ron Fellows in car number 63, the yellow Corvette in chase. Ron Fellows right now shown in 24th position overall. Incidentally, the Patrick that he said happy birthday to earlier on was his three-year-old son, Patrick, who's in Toronto Whoa. watching. And we have something, something on the board on the just a, uh, Oh, he's on fire. Is he well and truly on fire? Is he over the rail? One of the prototype cars. Hard to see. Don't want to say it looks like a Cadillac, but it, it has the shape of one of the Cadillacs. And one of the dam's Cadillacs in major trouble here. Obviously, the fuel has caught a light. You see oil burn, you see black clouds, you see them there, so it is an oil fire, but one of the dam's Cadillacs. We think we saw a driver leap through the smoke. The garage is there the, also. Over There's the guardrail. We saw the garage earlier in trouble. Philippe Gash's car, that appears to be in the cloud there also. Boy, it's still This is getting well. to be a very serious fire, gentlemen. They unless are not you, able to contain it. Unless you can get the bodywork off these cars very quickly, you can get yourself in all sorts of trouble. And once the carbon fiber catches fire, sometimes, David, you watch them burn to the ground. Absolutely. And remember, this car still has most of its tank of fuel on board. This we take to be on the Molson straight. Just past the kink before you go this over. Is just about before the hump, is The it? last hump, you see the flame still lit. Boy, that fire's got really hold on that car. And of course, it's full of fuel, as you just said. It's Look still at the leaking out. Full tanks, the race just 16 minutes, 17 minutes underway when this incident unfolded. The dam's Cadillac. Still on fire. We understand that to be the number four car. Still That's the car fire. that crashed earlier this morning. Cadillac North Star. Goosens, Colby. Colby crashed it this morning. Yeah, so driving it at the moment. 
well was. We certainly hope that Mr. Tinso is out of the car. I'm sure he is. But these European entered Cadillac you see the then of the dam's crew with their Motorola sponsorship there looking on. Obviously, they know they've lost one of their two cars. These cars all built in Indianapolis at the Riley and Scott shop. In fact, the dam's mechanics in March went to Indianapolis, spent a long time there assembling their own cars before they took it to Europe to do some testing. After boy, look the, at uh, that fire, boy, Darren. It still it will not, not go, go out. out. <laughs> still burning away. This is on board one of the Painos cars, TV Asahi Japan. They have back two of the Painos cars here. They have six Japanese drivers in those cars, but well, that was a good look over the shoulder of that car. We're not sure exactly what number that car is. One of the Team Dragon cars. We think it's the Suzuki car. running in 11th place, setting a very steady pace. Not quite as quick are the Japanese. And the Cadillac STS pace car is out. Now, here's an interesting point. The only team to run slow laps this morning in the warm-up was the Audi. And they said afterwards they were simulating uh, a pace car situation and wanted to document exactly the amount of fuel mileage they could get under yellow flag conditions. Well, Derek, Audi has been to six different racetracks this spring alone, simulating specific situations that they might find themselves in at Le Mans. I mentioned the heat. They tested at Kyalami in South Africa. They tested at Monza for their brakes. They've tested at a track that is a sort of proving ground for straightaway speed only. And they have exhaustively tested for virtually every situation. They probably even tested driving under a checkered flag to make sure there's no aerodynamic interference between a wave checkered flag and the top of their car. The so analogies I made earlier on, you know, about the cars, they, no one's done as much testing, I don't think, ever as Audi have done this year. And it shows as they dominate here, run one, two, and three. Huge GM presence here. We're on board the GM Cadillac STS safety car. We've had Corvette displays, Camaro displays, and we'll be back. We're back, and Wayne Taylor leaves the first of the uh, legitimate pit stops, let's say, brings the number two Cadillac in. Wayne will do a double stint. This, unfortunately, is another of the Cadillacs, the car run by the Dams team, the French-run Dams team. So while it burns itself to the ground, Wayne Taylor comes in, fuels up. Wayne was delayed away from the grid uh, at the start of this race. <laughs> Is the fire truck bringing just the heavy, getting there? Bringing the heavy metal in now, a bit late now. You know, At this we, stage, you need to bring a dumpster because it's way too late for that thing to get there. As we Here's the Courage back, which we saw courage. spinning on the uh, chicane earlier on. Yeah, Philippe Gash, you know, he, he had the steering wheel off the car, and this thing continues to burn. It continues to burn. Boy, they, that's why they decided to bring on the heavy hitters here, because this is absolutely unbelievable. Well, we have received the first of what we hope are a great many email communications. This one from Norbert Brochu asking, how much is the heat going to change the strategy of the teams? Are the drivers going to do shorter stints in the car? I think the answer is no. They'll well, stick with their... initially, no. And I actually asked this question to Mario Andretti, so it's, it's timely that it comes up on our email. By the way, you can email us on www.speedvision.com. We get the emails right here in the booth, so you can literally talk to us as this 24-hour race unfolds. But Mario Andretti said they will initially start on double stints. The heat is a factor they had not considered up until this morning, and if the drivers begin to complain, they will change their strategy only then if it physically becomes too difficult. But I will tell you what, it's not necessarily the painos that is the problem because it's, it's, it's an open cockpit. It's the likes of the Viper and the Corvette that are closed cockpit cars that are enormously warm. Dorsey, you have a story? John Paul Drio is the owner of the dams team. And John Paul, have you heard anything about the driver condition yet? I don't know exactly what happened because uh, I saw the same images that you saw on the screen. 
Uh, my driver started to talk, but I think that uh, he ejected himself as quick as he could because uh, the car was really on fire. So I had no explanation. The only thing is I can guess is that he's either uh, an engine failure or an oil pipe failure or whatever. But it's oil uh, leak uh, for any reason and going on the turbo and uh, that is uh, with turbo engine it's a uh, uh, disaster when that happens because it's catches, catching fire like hell. Tough break. The other car seems to be all right now. Will you uh, change plans or drivers on it? No, we are going to stay the way we are because the crews are not going to be changed. Uh, the first car is going to stay with Collard, Montagny and uh, Eric Bernard. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have the story. We don't know exactly what happened, but remember that was the car that was crashed this morning by Christian Colby. Both Vipers and both Corvettes have just made a stop, as has the lead Audi. So we are seeing uh, pit stops taking advantage of this yellow flag situation. There is one of the Corvette pit stops. Ron Fellows did stay in. That's Ron Fellows right there in car number 63. And David Brabham brings the car in. He's scheduled to do a double stint. He stays in the open cockpit carriage. Remember, this is course, front this is engine. One, on a day like today, of course, this is one of those really tricky situations. He was going to do two stints anyway, which are about 12 laps each. Now he's going to do two stints. He's actually going to end up doing two and a half. Exactly. So it's going to be a hot boy when he gets out in another in another 22 laps from now. And no tire changes for David Brabham. Unless they're doing a driver change, they try not to do a tire change because it loses about 25 to 28 seconds. The house is packed. We'll be right back. You know, I've run Indianapolis, and I, I think this place is every bit as special. And, uh, you know, there aren't many drivers that get the opportunity to win here. This year, I think, uh, with the Panos, we... You know, we, we have an opportunity, so uh, it, it's, it is a special event, and so one you really want to make sure you run hard at. It's unreal. It's, there's really no way to describe the magnitude of the race, but just every day the intensity continues to build, and, and it's not just coming to Le Mans for the first time for me, but it's coming with General Motors racing and Corvette racing. It really, you know, it's, it's interesting after being a racing driver now for 21 years, it's really an honor for me to be here with this team, and it just, it's, you know, it's a personal success for me, and like I say, it's, it's very, very exciting. I think it's fantastic. You know, this is a, a world-renowned race. Uh, it's uh, the, the icon of road racing, uh, not only in Europe, but I think also for all the motorheads back in the U.S. And uh, for our class, the GTO class, which is, or GT class, which is really production-based, to have two American makes be wiping off uh, everybody else in the field I think that's a, that's, that's a real testament to uh, sports cars in America. Um, well said, David Donahue, because believe it or not, the newspapers over here have been full of stories of the American battle of the Viper versus the Corvette. So a lot of people take, pay real close attention to how that finally turned out. I want to just tell you that Wayne Taylor brought the number two Cadillac back in again. There was a tire vibration, so they put another new set of boots on that thing and sent him back out. We have had all the Audis in, um, I believe, also. There you get a great aerial shot at the end of the Porsche curves. That left-hander there, that's a wicked corner. It really is a very, very fast and off camber. Uh, but you've got to come out of there fast, because as you can see, from there to the first of the Ford chicanes, is pretty well flat out. That kink in the far distance is flat. David, we have an email here from Robert Woodward as we look at one of the Audis of McNish in slow motion. This was the pole sitter, and you see, by the way, how little suspension deflection there is when he hits the curbing there. Just about half inch only on that front suspension, half an inch of suspension movement. Robert Woodward mentions removing the hill for safety's sake, a point I had made. I think uh, he says, would it deprive the driver of a chance to show some skill and I think in this case no it really never amounted to any real skill going over there it was nerve and and you just got unlucky sometimes uh, if you caught a bad uh, bit of wind and I think that that's one place where you can make something safe without taking away something that uh, contributes to skill 
It takes away a lot of the character, though, because that hill was always such a daunting thing. Obviously not so daunting now because you don't get there, anything like the speed. Audi number nine is in, and Calvin, you're there? Yes, I am, Derek. Alan McNish is in. He takes a nice drink while the crew goes to work. Of course, the car stays on the ground. Engine shut off during the refueling. They're the rules here. It normally takes about 28 seconds for the fuel to go in. They'll wait for that vent return before they pop that. They're inspecting the tires. We expected double stints on the tires. I do not see any tires ready. The fueling is complete. They ask out the fire back up. Big crowd in front of him now. A lot of cameras down here. But they are changing the tyres on Michele Alvarello's car by the look of things. The decision on the tyres could have to do with the track temperature. At a certain point, they're going to change compounds if it gets a little bit cooler. Calvin is with Michele Alvarello. Calvin? the tyres on Michele Alvarado's car and he was running third, maybe not the quickest of the three. What they like to do is to inspect the tyres. This really gives them a read for the whole team. I understand all of the Audi cars are running the medium compound Michelin, so this will give the Michelin engineers a chance to inspect the tyres and see what the wear rate is like. They were great shots in our pit lane there. They were shots from uh, our own speed vision camera carried by David Nichols from Indianapolis. We're going to try and do this as much as we can. Move our cameras around the positions in the pit lane and just show you the live action. Put it into your living room as much as we can as this whole 24 hours unfolds. Well, here's another question. Uh, this one uh, about I'm a NASCAR fan and watch most of the races in your show. I was wondering how the drivers managed to drive so many miles, drinking fluids at every pit stop without going to the bathroom. Because it all goes out in perspiration. It's quite extraordinary how much you can drink in a race and, uh, and not have to go to the bathroom. Can I just tell you, Chris Neifel tried to put on 10 pounds weight in the last week, knowing that he would lose at least that much during the course of this event. Prehydration as much as 10 pounds, that was enormous. And I put on 10 pounds of weight last week without even trying <laughs> at all. <laughs> and, now you, and by the looks of your, your lips, that sweats are on there, if you're losing it as we speak. <laughs> Two Cadillacs. question from Michael and Tracy Smith. I hope that sort of answers it, guys. There's the Dams Cadillac. Two black Motorola Dams cars run by the French team. One we know was involved in the barbecue. It's dead and buried. The second one, right behind him, is the second of the right hand Scott run cars. Dorsey Schrader is down there, and I believe Andy Wallace is behind the wheel. Dorsey? Emmanuel Collard brought this car in. They're going to put four tires on it for sure. When I was talking to Ron Fellows on the GT grid, he said tires were a major issue. They have never run the tires at this type of temperature before. This car is taking four. In front of me, the other Cadillac is up there. They're not putting any tires on that. Just fuel for that one. Everything going smoothly so far on this pit stop. I don't know whether we made it quite clear, but you can't touch the car until the fuel is in. Uh, and the engine has to stay off all the time. We probably should mention the tire battle. We have four Cadillacs, with three now. The two French cars run on Michelin tires, and the two factory cars run from Indianapolis run on the Pirelli tires. Pirelli have struggled here all week so far. The Michelin tires appear to be quite a bit faster and more consistent. I think they may all be, all the uh, Cadillacs may be on Pirelli's. Derek, but certainly you're right in saying that the Pirelli shot cars have struggled in comparison with the Michelins, which are right. aboard the Audis, uh, which have run just so smoothly. They have a wonderful uh, program. They've tested as often as the Audi team itself. So, Audi Sport Team Yost carrying the famous number seven. Can they win again? Welcome back to Speed Vision's live coverage of the Le Mans 24 hour race. It will be a 25 hour broadcast for Speed Vision, interrupted only briefly for live qualifying from the Canadian Grand Prix. We have a lot of US interest stories here from drivers, from Corvettes versus Vipers, uh, from Mario Andretti, from the Cadillacs. We have so many great stories here that we're going to follow for you. The reason we're under yellow is because of a fire in one of the Cadillacs, one of the French-run dams cars. It has been so ferocious on the back straight, they have not been able to put it out hardly. Uh, they have fire tenders out there right now trying to gather the car up and get it away from the track. 
So the Cadillac STS North Star pace car continues to hold these boys in line here. When we come back, we're going to talk to a special guest, Tommy Kendall. Up from Canada very shortly, so keep watching. And I think it's going to be very tight, don't you? Uh, yeah. yeah. And I believe Michael Schumacher was fastest at the end of the day yesterday. Now, so why we are under yellow here and watch the second of the Chrysler prototypes, the one that is still running. We lost one earlier on, driven by Yannick Dalmas. We'll take a chance to vi uh, visit with one of our very special guests who's made his way up to our booth here, Tommy Kendall. Tommy, great to see you here. It's good to be here. And this is your first time at Le Mans? Yes. I mean, tell me your impression when you drove around this eight and a half mile road series. Well, I consider myself a you know pretty big fan. I follow things as closely as I can, but there's no way, uh, much like going to Indianapolis, I'm sure, there's no way to, uh, for words or pictures to do it justice. You have to be here, just the, the scale of everything. The course itself, uh, in its present form with the chicanes, it's just, uh, it's unbelievable. I, you know, when I was driving along as fast as we were going into all the chicanes, I was trying to imagine what it would be like without the chicanes. I, you probably raced here, Derek, without the chicanes. Without the chicanes, yeah. And uh, I heard Danny Sullivan was uh, swapping some stories. And uh, in some ways, I'm kind of glad that I never got to do that. Uh, I've heard some pretty brave guys say that it was uh, lunacy. The first year I came here, we were in the uh, five-car Jaguar team. We did 248 miles an hour down the straight in the daytime and 250 at night. I was impressed by those numbers until I realized David Hobbs was doing those type of speeds back in the 70s. <laughs> well, we did, we did 210 here in 1968 in four GT40s <laughs> when the race was run in September. And that was only with 375 horsepower, but of course it had none of the modern aerodynamic uh, downforce, so therefore it didn't have the drag. Obviously it's a much smaller car, but 210 with about 370 horsepower was definitely getting on with the program. And that kink, that right-hand kink, and of course the rise after it, really were pretty scary in those days because those cars used to just skim along the top of the road at those sort of speeds because the air was used to pack underneath it and god knows what's sort of you're, you you're a big guy how are you fitting in the car believe it or not this is the first car i've ever driven where there was no not even minor modification i just got in the seats on sliders and i was you know i the team is based in Germany, and this came together very last minute, and so I was talking to them on the phone and saying, you've got to make sure we have adjustment in the seat, the steering column, spacers, all this. I got in, and it was uh, didn't have to change a thing. It's unbelievable. Now, this is one of the Conrad 911 GTS cars that you're in with Von Gartzen and with uh, Charlie Slater as your teammates. One thing that you mentioned to me, Tommy, just a couple of days ago was that you have not braked with your right foot for nine years. How difficult that has been to adapt to a completely different driving style and drive a Porsche 911. Well, in a lot of ways, I feel like a rookie. I have never been to Le Mans, never driven a Porsche, and haven't driven with brake with my right foot for nine. Uh, since before my accident, I switched to left foot braking beforehand. After my accident, um, I didn't have the option anymore because I have no flexibility in my right ankle. and. It, it hasn't been as bad as I thought. I'm actually able to heel toe and match the revs so that we're not too hard on the gearbox. But my right foot, uh, the nice way to put it is it's probably uh, slightly learning disabled because uh, it's not, the message doesn't always get from my brain down to the right foot. And so I'm a little frustrated in that I can't, I'm not as quick as, as I know I could be. But at the same time, they're all, they're tickled to death that I'm running as fast as I, as I am. Uh, but knowing where I'm leaving a little bit on the table is uh, tough. Boy, look at that piece of carnage there that is not the kind of wreck you want to see that's about what your car looked like after your crash at Watkins Glen yeah about like it there's a little bit more up front there but um, this car is nothing like as much damage as, as your car was at the front end it's obviously badly mangled by fire and that's not the sort of sight you want to see with only 13 laps or so completed Tommy you've had such a superb career with such achievements particularly in the Trans Am but other areas as well we haven't heard much from you in the last year. What's going on? Well, I've been uh, pretty much uh, underground, keeping a very low profile. Uh, you know, a number of things. When Ford withdrew from Trans Am, that was kind of the beginning of, of a little bit of a hiatus. I didn't, but once I had a little taste of it, I kind of enjoyed it. And uh, it, I needed a little bit of a break, and it was a good time because there wasn't a whole lot happening, especially Trans Am wise and road racing. And about six months ago, I really started missing things, and so I started paying a little bit more attention. But we're still, uh, you know, my standards are, are pretty high in terms of what I'm looking for. But there's a lot of really good stuff happening, the really positive stuff happening in the Trans Am now with uh, Panos and Sanchez involved. Obviously, road racing's really kind of swung back. So there's a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon for next year. And I'm pretty safe to say I'll, uh, I'll probably be back on a full-time basis next year. 
Tommy, uh, I know you're not going to drive for about another hour and a half, is that right? Right. Uh, we're just going to take a quick break. Could you stay on with us just for another little bit? Sure. We'll have a chat. Uh, we're just going to take another quick break. Uh, as you watch the silver Cadillac Seville STS-1, this is the Cunningham edition that paces the field here at Le Mans. Speed Vision's exclusive coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by Cadillac, the power of AND, the fusion of design and technology. I bet the water in that makeshift shower was a lot hotter than it was in my hotel room here in Le Mans this morning. I, Steve Evans, am the only Le Mans version of all the announcers on this staff. I've followed the race all my life. My first chance to actually be here. And what blows me away is all the accommodations of the Loire Valley, from expensive chateaus to little one-star hotels. But 200 of the 250,000 fans do it just like this. They do it in the dirt, from RVs to tents, and more tents than big buck RVs. But nobody is doing it any better than my friends from England here. You saw the shower, got all the cooking apparatus. They got a tent they must have bought at the mash auction. Got to come over here. Hey, a man's got to shave, you know. Cleanliness is godliness. And I, I'm telling you, and they've got food like you wouldn't believe. In fact, they just finished breakfast. They plan to eat a lot heartier tomorrow. Let me ask you guys, you having a good time? Excellent, thank you. Yeah, it's very good. Lovely weather. Super food and four-star accommodation. What more could you want? <laughs> What's on the menu for today? Um, well, we had full English breakfast this morning. Sausage, bacon, fried bread, uh, eggs, beans, tomatoes. Um, we've got some lunch lined up. And then tonight, it's the uh, chicken curry with all the trimmings tonight. I may just stop by. And if you're somebody that has to have the morning paper every day, no problem. Audi Racing puts this out every day in four different languages. And it's not just racing. You can also get... The ball scores. What more could you want? Well, I thought, David, a typical English lunch was uh, in those green bottles. Yes, it looked a bit like it. Is, it? is that an Irish lunch? That's an Irish lunch, that <laughs> yeah. 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 Speaking of green, have a look at this here. This is one of the uh, Cadillac North Star mechanics. Didn't realize the uh, headgear would get himself on television. We actually have had Wayne Taylor in for his third pit stop. In about the last three laps, the number 64 Corvette is just in. But we still have Tommy Kendall back up here with us because we are still behind the STSI Cunningham Edition Cadillac Seville. Place in the car, still trying to clean up the fire. Uh, Tommy, we're taking emails on uh, www.speedvision.com. One of the early questions was how much the heat is going to affect people. Mario Andretti said he's never seen it as hot here in all the years he's been here. When, when, you, when, you, when you do double stints in an enclosed car like you're in, I mean, how much of a factor is the heat? It's definitely a factor. Well, it's, it's a limiting factor, really. Uh, the cars are not that physical to drive. This course is pretty easy on the drivers. Uh, G-loads, you've got enough time to rest. But uh, you run full windows on both sides, so there's not a lot of airflow. I noticed that they were doing a driver change on the Corvette, which surprised me uh, that they wouldn't. You know, sometimes when you get an odd stop like this, you, you just fuel it up and you go. But uh, our plan is to do single stints uh, at first, and then when we get into the night, hopefully maybe do doubles. Actually, hang on, Dorsey, are you down there in the Corvette pit? Corvette's getting away here. Andy Pilgrim just got out of the car. I'm going to try to get a word with him. Kelly Collins is in. They've taken four tires and fuel. In the meantime, that third pit stop for Wayne Taylor. Wayne Taylor came in, didn't take tires, and said he didn't like them when he got back on the racetrack. They came in, they put tires on it, then he went back in again and topped up with fuel. Let me get over here with Andy and see if I can uh, get a word here. See how warm he is. Andy Pilgrim, you just got out of the car. How hot is it out there? Yes. <laughs> It's real hot. Um, it's extremely hot, especially on the pace laps. Actually, we're getting a bit of um, breeze when we're not on the pace lap. You know, when you're running, you're getting a pretty good wind through the car because they've got some good vents. But on the pace lap, you're just sitting like a cooker. I mean, it just cooks you. So it's very warm, but not, not undrivable. It's not unbearable. What could you tell about the incident with the dam's car? Is there anything? I saw skid marks off to the right, and it, I don't know whether he knew he was on fire or what. I didn't see the incident, but I could see a lot of big, big skid marks going off to the right, and that seemed to be where the car ended up. And it was facing the correct way, and it was just in flames. I mean, there was just a ton of fire. Lastly, how's the car feel to you? How's it going? Our car's going great. 
The car is perfect right now. We were just running a good pace, solid pace. I think, you know, the Vipers are running a solid pace too. So just got to keep it running. Good luck, mate. Thanks. Uh, currently shown the Vipers, the 51 and 52 car, 20th and 21st overall. The first of the Corvettes is the, uh, is the I'm looking down the scoring chart here. While you do that, it's an interesting point that the Thanos has taken the lead from the Audis uh, as a result of the pit action. There's a Panos, an American car, leading Le Mans just about half an hour into the action. The number 63 Corvette is running 36th at the moment. That is uh, obviously uh, a little bit further back than he wanted. The 64 car that Pilgrim just got out, that Kelly Collins just got into, is 28th overall, and that is only six positions behind the Chrysler or the, uh, the Viper. We've got a long, long way to go. Tommy Kendall is still here with us. We're going to still use uh, his unusual insight as he's been on the racetrack. We'll be back in just a moment. Any good engineer will tell you that the study of aerodynamics is part science and part intuition. You can speak of coefficient of friction, and center of pressure, but the main idea is to take the 3,000 parts that make up a car and squeeze them into the smallest possible package better to be a dart than a brick. Think of the body shaping and sculpting the air around it. The air wants to be disturbed as little as possible, so the body must be small at the front and then expand smoothly to reduce drag. Every detail counts. Now, although the air impedes the car, it also gives it light. The engine needs air to breathe. The radiators and brakes need air for cooling. The wings and undertrays need air to create downforce. All this is science and engineering, quantified and formulaic. But there remains this mystery. Cars that are fast are almost always beautiful. And the faster a car goes, the more beautiful it looks. Welcome back live. Speed Vision's coverage of the Le Mans 24 hour race. This is another pit stop for the Chrysler Viper. Carl Wendlinger stays in the car. Calvin? Yes, he's in, Derek, and the brake technician went to look at the front rotors and pads. No problems there. Carl is getting an assist. He's getting a fresh drink bottle, I believe, from one of the crew. And uh, they're just doing fuel. No tires available. They've really tried to maximize this caution period, bring him in at the last possible moment, top the car up with fuel, and that will put them a little out of sequence with the vets. But obviously, the vets came in as well, so they're only a couple of laps down under caution, which doesn't use a lot of gas anyway. They're looking at some uh, readout over on the right-hand side. Looks like they've got the laptop plugged in, getting some telemetry readout from the car. Carl fires it back up. He's back underway. Tommy Kendall, as we watch the Viper leave, is there much of a speed difference between uh, a GT car, a GTS car, and the, and the uh, LMP cars? Well, I would venture to say this might be the closest they've ever been because the slowest, the GT3 cars are running close to 180 miles an hour, and the top prototypes are just over 200 with the, the air restrictor choked off the speed of the faster cars and then the slower cars have much less drag and so uh, you know you're looking at like a 20 25 mile an hour where it used to be you know maybe close to a hundred in some of the older days Tommy we have an email from Patricia Rahili do you think that the high ambient temperature combined with the engine heat can be associated with the oil pressure problems of the Chrysler LMP and the oil leak of the dams Cadillac that caused the fire what a technical question, but it's hard to say. You wouldn't, I'd say no. You wouldn't think this early on. These are probably things that were, uh, you know, something that uh, a failure of some sort. I think there will definitely have an effect. As I bet you, the attrition will be much higher than usual due to the heat. Um, good question, Patricia. On the on the on the the Chrysler engine, that is a pure prototype. Although the engine has actually been running for two years, they, they really have no experience with that car at racing speeds, and this is purely a test session. So whatever broke there is almost a normal part of a oh, testing look at session. That. And a something else body broke part. there. That looked like something coming off the pace car almost, or it just it ran did. over something. Whatever it is, it's big. Big and light. Yeah, big and light. I just want to finish my point for Patricia. On the dams car, uh, you might have heard earlier on, that was the car that was crashed this morning by Christian Colby. Now, we presume they had enough time to fix that, but when you hit something against the barrier here, some, uh, very often you can't visually tell everything that's broken. And you can snap an oil line that's, that's been cracked.
I must say clearly that uh, if I would have won Le Mans, say even in 95 when we finished second, I would still be here today to try to go for it again. So uh, I love to be here first and foremost. I just love to drive here. And of course, the objective is to come and win. Otherwise, uh, you know, just to come here and just riding around, there's no reward to that, really. I only like to come when I have a chance, even on paper, a realistic chance of winning. And I think that's, that's here with me now. If you go to a race and you think you're not going to win, you should stay in bed. I think I should have the speed that, uh, to, uh, to be able to contribute. I know, otherwise I'll take the first train home, quite honestly. So, but I uh, tested and uh, feel comfortable you know, in the car. And, uh, and I know that uh, knowing what this particular race can throw at you, all of uh, uh, the potential, the different conditions, and so on and so forth, uh, these are all the things that I think I'm well prepared for. So uh, all in all, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, this challenge is what I really am looking for. We are back live on Speed Vision, and this is the head of the field. David Brabham in the paint, Oscar, is leading from the Audi number nine, driven by Alan McNish, the man who was on the pole. Uh, pit stops have caused this, uh, uh, this uh, situation on the track. David Brabham pitted earlier, then McNish came in afterwards under yellow. So McNish gonna run down David Brabham, but that is the car, the red paint that Mario Andretti will get into in about two, about three hours from now. The driver's gonna do double stints, but because of these yellow flag pit stops, these double stints might become almost triple stints, but we are just past the top of the first hour. We're gonna take a little moment here to go back and show you in our Cadillac recap what it looked like in the first hour. And here was the start, the Audi domination, one, two, three, leading away from David Brabham. And first lap was without incident as the uh, procession started led by Alan McNish. Then, Dave, with the first incident of note. One of the cool eyes is at the first chicane. This is Johansson. He's just out of the picture here, Stefan Johansson coming along. And there's going to be some adroit moving here. The Kouraj spins at the head of this little group. And uh, Kato, in the second of the Panos, just misses that Kouraj. And then Sam, the barbecue. This is one of the dams, Cadillacs, the cars prepared here in Europe. It's Tinso's car. He, the same car, had trouble in the warm-up earlier today in different hands. And uh, it came a cropper again. That car obviously out of the race. The Cadillac entry now reduced to three cars. And Wayne Taylor has had three pit stops in his car. They've had a tire vibration. They're trying to identify it. So Wayne Taylor not happy as Alan McNish now begins to run down David Brabham. These Audi cars... They have spent in excess of $100 million. This is a battle for the lead early in the race, but the budget is in excess of $100 million trying for Audi to win the Le Mans 24-hour race here. The Painos car has not handled well since, we since Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday practice sessions, and he's going to break the draft. This is a 24-hour race, fans, but I think we're seeing a little uh, action here. And McNish decides sensibly not to try and go down the inside in the braking zone, but the Painos cars, they have had to redo the aerodynamic balance of this car because of a rule change brought in by the ACO. There's a big gurney flap on the rear wing, and there is louvers behind the nose cone above the front wheels. This Painos car has never been a happy motor car since then aerodynamically it's unstable particularly at high speed turning into corners derek an interesting thing is the audi engineers said we do not want to draft other cars it's hot and uh, we don't want the temperatures to climb he is right now drafting david brabham most de decisively well we have a very experienced current driver in the booth <coughs> tommy what do you think about all that sort of weaving to guard your position because i mean that was a pretty blatant weave 
Well, maybe Brabham's just trying to help him stay in clean air so he doesn't overheat. Ah, very him. well put. <laughs> actually, in all seriousness, I mean, they've talked about how this race has become a sprint race. You've got much younger drivers. They run like it as a sprint race. Now this is the kind of the final frontier when you start seeing guys weaving to uh, hold a, a car off. In with, the, 23 you know, hours with 23 to hours to go. So. Well, no, it's only 22 hours and 50 minutes. Oh, well, oh, oh I'm sorry. That, that much closer everything. to the end than I well, thought. Exactly. It changes everything. This is that very fast run down to Indianapolis. A couple of real quick right-hand sweeps. Uh, the road drops away there. That's where that Mercedes uh, went flying last year. And into this tremendously fast right-hander. Hard on the brakes to go through Indianapolis here, this left-hander which is one of the slower corners here, but it's slightly banked, so it's pretty quick. Arnage, slow, second gear, corner. Important to get the exit right, because you've got a long, fast run down to the port. The town field. itself is off to the left here. If you don't make the turn, you go right into the main street of the town. And if you really run into trouble, you can stop. And just over the guardrail to the right, there's a whole bunch of houses that been built in the last 20 years, so you can pop in there for a nice cup of tea. You see the second Audi, just at the top of our picture. This is the Porsche Curves. These are incredibly fast. The television pictures does not really do justice to the speed, the velocity of these projectiles down through these Porsche curves. When you get it right in qualifying here, you can almost go through the Porsche curves flat, but you better be hanging on and hold your breath and hope you have the best of qualifying tires because it is downright scary. You better get the, you better get the first one right because once you get out of shape and get offline, I mean, you're done for and that last, uh, Left hand is very tricky. This is the Ford chicane, a double chicane. Tommy, how's left, your car? Right, left, right. Uh, our car is the Porsche. Really is. Uh, it's, it really it's kind of like a road car. A lot of these cars have passed it by. It's, it's a strong suit. It's just that it uh, traditionally runs all day. Through there, it wallows around a little bit. The first one, which is third gear. You can get all over the curbs, they don't upset the car. The next part is second gear, much slower, and you really kind of have to stay off the curbs here. Here you can use that first curb like uh, McNish did. The, these next two, you kind of want to stay off. Some curbs are, are, are smooth but raised. Some are like alligator's teeth, and then some are just painted, like the second part of the Dunlop curbs here. You'll watch them right, drive right over it. That's just a painted curb there. These two down here are raised, so they're all a little bit different. Uh, you know, conventional wisdom is you want to, like that one, McNish is all over that one. He really, uh, I think, is getting a little frustrated once he get a good run on. That on might be the most here. important corner on the track, Tommy, right there, that slow one onto the, onto the back straight. It is, and it's downhill. It's, it's, it's a tough corner because uh, if, you, if you really commit to those curbs, it buys you about an extra four feet on the inside. And so I, I'm not sure you'd want to do that every lap, but to get by another car like this, it might be worth it. Well, that's one of the things about these cars. When we talk about $100 million being spent by Audi to develop these cars, these oh, cars have to be developed incredibly strong as well. A Formula One car is built and designed to do about 200 miles. Yeah. These guys are going to build a Formula One car that's going to do 3,000 miles, including all that curb hopping and bouncing off the odd car and careering through the gravel trap, and it's got to be able to stand all that sort of stuff. And now the headlights are ablaze on the Panos and the three Audis. Alboreto is in car number seven, that is third, behind Alan McNish. Frank Bila is an Audi number eight, fourth on the row, third in line of the Audis, and they are now all over the back of David Brabham. David Brabham in the braking zones was one of the biggest problem on these Panos cars. They were unstable and hard to handle when you braked late from high speed, and that's where McNish is probably going to make the challenge. These two drivers, of course, know each other very well. Back in 1990, they raced against each other in the British Formula 3000 Championship and have crossed each other's paths many, many times. Alan McNish never made it to Formula One, although people now say he may be in line to be involved in the Toyota Formula One project. Formula Three, they battled together in 1990, not 3000. So McNish all over the back of David Brabham, and there is Alboreto's car beginning to close in, and Frank Bila watches from a grandstand view. I don't think uh, McNish needs to do anything brave. No, he doesn't probably, because in all probability, we're not sure yet, we haven't had a good run without that long caution, but, but in all probability, the Audis can do about one more lap on fuel than the Painos, and that, of course, could be the undoing of the Painos because it's going gonna, it's gonna to add up 13 laps as opposed to 14 laps over the entire length of this race. There's a lot of extra stop. As we watch these three Audis, it is very difficult to pick them out and identify one from the other. What they've done for us, mainly for television, is McNish and um, is in the yellow 
winged car and the yellow cockpit. So the car driven by McNish, Laurent, a yellow, and Stefan Ortelli. The one you watch right now is predominant to the yellow accent. Right behind him, in the number seven car, Christian Apt, Alberto, and Capello. You see that? They have black accents, black rear wing, and a black cockpit cover. And then the Frank Biela, Tom Christensen, and Emmanuel Piro car, which is not in our picture right now, has a red accent. And of course, you've trained yourself to know what the colors are, you can follow it. And of course, the three colors are the colors of the German flag, red, black, and yellow. So and very... the, the color of the car, silver, is the national racing color of Germany. Uh, the, the official national race in color of Germany is white, but... Uh This is where you really have to kind of check yourself because uh, it's, he really has no reason to, to get antsy, but the juices get flowing and all that goes out the window. You're, you know, your teammate's starting to catch you up. He had a pretty good lead before the yellow came out. And uh, so, I mean, that, it's easy to sit here and say that, but, uh, oh, there he goes. There he goes, lines them up for three laps and at the first chicane down the inside. That's one of the new chicanes, of course. That is called the Motorola chicane. Alvareto will probably do the same thing. David Brabham knows there's a long, long way to go. Tommy Kendall has to leave. Thank you, Tommy. We're going to watch you on the track later on. We'll be back. Good luck to you. Welcome, welcome back to Le Mans. Christophe Tinsot has made his way back to the pits. Christophe, we see your arm is badly bandaged up there. What happened on the track? Uh, just uh, after eight or seven lap, I don't remember, but sure, uh, I have some big problem on the, on the rear car because uh, the fire, fire arrived the long stray at 300 k's, so it's very uh, high speed. And uh, when I see uh, a big fire arrive on my back, I complete in the fire, and uh, my, uh, my best thing to stop early as possible, I can stop the car. I go in the guard right to stop the car, and I exit uh, completing the fire. It's not very bad for me because I adjust a little uh, burn on the left arm, but uh, for the race, it sure is very bad. They said there was black skid marks on the track where the car ended up. Did you lose control or just pull over very quickly? Uh, pull over very quickly because it's uh, approximately eight or 10 seconds to stop the car. Because uh, 300 k is very fast, great, fast speed. So uh, I begin to brake, it's a very long brake, and I stop the car, sure. I think I exit of the car before uh, the car stop, complete stop. There seemed to be a big delay before the fire marshals and everything got there. What was the reason for that? Were you between the corner stations effectively? No, because when I begin to, to brake, uh, I across uh, the first marshal, it's just between two, uh, two stops of the marshal, so I need uh, 30 seconds. But, but I, have, I think I, I stayed uh, 30 or 40 liters in the car, so it's huge. And I, the fire uh, can stay under my uh, rear engine cover. cover. And uh, this is the reason the, the guy needs some, a lot of water to stop the fire. Well, we're sorry to see you out of the event, but we're glad you're not too badly burned up. Great to see you back in the pits. Goodbye. And as you watch the fight develop, Alberto makes his way past David Brabham. There really is nothing David Brabham can do about this. These racing cars built by Audi are just simply faster than anything else here. So this is not unusual. However, the fact that David is still in the right in the middle of this fight um, bodes well for what might happen okay. as this race unfolds here. Remember, reliability may be the friend of the Panos here because these Audis were so heavily favorites, are favored. We've seen these favorites drop off in the past. Derek, we have another David, David Donahue, who's just joined us here in the uh, announce booth. And of course, David, you're driving one of the Vipers, a closed car. How about the heat? What's the situation? Uh, it's horrible. That's the yeah. situation. They were, uh, they were quite happy at Sebring when we had all the windows out of the car to get it down to 152 degrees inside. Oh, down to 150. <laughs> yeah. 
So oh, they were sure. all excited about that, and we're running with a. Well, we took one window out, which uh, seems to not really affect the arrow too much, but uh, at least you're it, running with the windows up in order to have a slipperier car, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the theory, but uh, I really don't think at the speeds we're doing uh, uh, that the air even gets to the window. I think it just kind of goes right on by. Those speeds being what? Almost 200. Very high. Yeah. Yeah. David, are you surprised that, that after, uh, in the second hour, you see these front runners nose to tail here, battling, drafting each other, trying to block each other in the braking zones? Yeah, it's, uh, it's always quite a fight, and it, it's going to be a bit that way in the uh, GTS class, I think, as well, although we got spread out because of the yellow. Um, it's really a survival of the fittest. Whoever, uh, whoever can makes it to the end with such a horrible pace, very strong pace, then... Uh, They'll be the winners. Believe it or not, I spoke to Bob Wallach in Sebring about the heat inside the cars. He said he has spent years trying to convince the Porsche engineers that they need air conditioning in the car, that the driver would be quicker overall on a long stint. He said he can never convince an engineer that it is hot as it is. I mean, do you believe the engineers understand what a driver has to go through and the, and the enormous heat you have to work work, work inside? Yeah, there are a lot of times I wish I could duct tape one in there. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. Take him for, not only take him for a ride, but a, ride in, a long ride in the heat. We actually, we put a uh, insulated water bottle into the car uh, during practice, and it started at uh, 3 degrees Celsius, and uh, after two laps, it was 32 degrees Celsius. In two laps? <laughs> Describe wow. the, 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 the effect of the heat. I mean, it's claustrophobic, it uh, affects your judgment. It's not just being uncomfortable. That's yeah, and the sweat's running into your eyes. Uh, you, know, you get out, and you just, uh, you don't realize how much effort you've actually put forward. Uh, it gets, sometimes it gets hard to stand up when you get out of the car just because the adrenaline is keeping you going. Well, when you're driving in those terrific heats too, I mean, you're, you're quite, a physical, quite a physical effort is going on, so you've generated a lot of internal heat and your blood temperature goes up and of course it gets hot enough, I mean, you're going to start definitely losing efficiency. Yeah, that's right. In a race this long, it's, uh, it's extremely difficult because you think about the heat more because you know you're going to be in the car about oh. eight, you know, eight hours worth. That was the rock. VW out of the race, at least for the time being, in the garage uh, with a misfire. Had been running in the top 15, and you see Brabham, David Brabham, uh, now being attacked by the third of the three Audis. He's slowly dropping back out of the lead. David Murray appears to be in trouble. We're going to follow what happens to him also. Dorsey? I'm down here with the David Murray in Formix 82 Porsche. He has had some sort of an altercation with a different car. Back into the car has been pretty well damaged. He's gotten the muffler. I can see that, the muffler support. Whole right rear corner. They're looking underneath there now for suspension damage. In fact, they uh, look like they're going to be taking some su suspension bits off. He's been off the road because I see them digging out some grass. So uh, I don't know if this is another car or a guardrail. Looks more right now like he's gotten back into a guardrail, guys. Dorsey, I thought it was uh, real racing. What's this muffler business? Yeah, that's the truth, isn't it? These Porsches have two little mufflers. You see the one right there is all bent up. The bracket's bent up, and uh, this pit stop was hurried. Now they seem to be slowing it down a little bit. I think this probably hurt the right rear of the car. And now they're putting the tire back on it. And uh, this doesn't look good for David Murray. You see that the deck lid's off, and you know that that has the spoiler on it. So they can't really want to drive without that spoiler. He'll lose all rear downforce. When you mention the spoiler, don't go talk to race director Tony Dow, who runs Dick Barber's car, and talk about mufflers, because they came here for the test and did not use them. When they came back, they were told, now you have to put them on. So it's the added weight, it's the loss of horsepower, and it's the untried mounting brackets that, that concern that team, having been here for the test and told that they didn't have to use them. And the other thing, of course, is those exhaust, I mean, those silences generate a lot of heat. And wouldn't you know, the first time they make them put them on, you get a 95 degree day. I mean, talk about a combination of things going the way you don't want them to go. Well, in the meantime, they've taken the car behind the wall, not behind the wall, but back into the garage area. And it is indeed uh, pretty damaged at the back end. So they're going to park this car for a while and do some, da uh, some repairs. But uh, it's going to go a long way down, guys. That is the ski racing entry. David Murray, Johnny Molum, and Sasha Masson behind the wheel, hoping they're in the LMGT class. David Donnie, who is still here with us, we're gonna ask him to wait and we'll be right back. 